Um, are we on? I'm on. Um, I think we'll get started. I know there's... I need my third board member so we can get started. We have a number of elected officials that need to speak in the next few minutes. Good morning. Welcome all to this informal workshop to receive comments. I'm glad you guys are all, this is good, you're all engaged. I know it's not a party, but you're all having good conversations, working things out, no doubt. Great. Um, good morning and welcome to this informal workshop to receive comments on a drought contingency plan and associated temporary urgency change petition filed by the Department of Water Resources and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to modify Delta water quality and flow requirements during drought conditions as well as the executive director's order partially approving the temporary urgency change. I'm Felicia Marcus, chair of the state board. To my left, vice chair Fran Spivey Weber. To her left, board member Didi Diadamo. To my right, board member Tam Doduck. Uh, before we get started, under building rules, I, I have to make a few emergency evacuation announcements. Please look for the exit nearest you. If you hear an emergency sound, pick up your stuff, take your friends, walk carefully outside. We gather near J and 10th Street if you want to know when the all clear sounds and you can come back with us. Um, also know that this meeting is being webcast and recorded, so it's very important when you come up to speak that you speak close to the microphone, even if we can hear you, we wanna make sure that everybody else in the room can hear you and that people watching over the webcast can also uh, hear you. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about our process quickly and then uh, bifurcate some of the uh, uh, discussion because we have a number of elected officials who have a hard stop and uh, I want to be able to hear from them before we um, we proceed, uh, but let me just do a, a couple of introductory things. The workshop's being held in accordance with the public notice dated January 27, 2015. This is an informal workshop. The State Board will not take any formal action and there will be no sworn testimony or cross-examination of participants today. The board members and its staff may, however, ask clarifying questions of the speakers. After we get the comments at the workshop, the Water Board may provide direction to staff regarding future activities, which could include future hearings, actions, et cetera. The, the purpose of this is to actually hear from you, for us, but also for Mr. Howard and the staff. We're gonna be receiving public input on the February 3rd, 2015 Executive Director Order approving in part and denying in part a temporary urgency change petition filed by the Department of Water Resources and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation or petitioners to modify their water right requirements to meet Delta water quality and flow objectives in response to drought conditions. Specifically, the petitioners requested temporary modification of their Central Valley Project and State Water Project water right permit and license terms regarding Delta outflow, San Joaquin River flow, Delta cross channel gate closure, and export limit requirements included in State Water Board Revised Decision 1641. The petition also indicated that additional requests for modifications to Delta flow and water quality requirements may be made in response to prolonged drought conditions. In addition to comments on the petition and the executive director's order, we will receive public input on a drought contingency plan filed by the petitioners in January 2015. Oh, also, please put all cell phones and pagers on silent if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to forego an explanation of the proceedings in, de in, in depth for the moment. Uh, just to say we're going to have a series of panels and quite a few groups wanted to come forward as panels. We do have many hours of that and I know we'll also have members of the public. I'll try and accommodate that as best I can. We tend to take the panels first. Uh, I know some people will need to leave and so we'll just try and save a little time uh, before lunch. I encourage you all to listen 
to what everyone has to say so you can put yourselves in our shoes, which is uh, to have open minds, open ears, open hearts, listening to everyone. Um, before I say more, I'd like to turn to our elected officials who've graced us with their presence, and I know they have some hard stops and meetings they have to get to, and so um, I think I know who they are. There may be others. Thank you very much. Uh, these are all. Um, I think I should begin with you, Senator Fuller, Mind? and then I'll go to Senator Cannella and then Assemblyman Gray. Thank you for your kind consideration this morning of all the schedules and things that we have in other places. Um, we really appreciate your time. You are the ladies that put in really a lot of time, and I know because I feel like I take more of it than normal. But beyond that, I'd like to thank the chairwomen and members. Earlier this month, my colleagues and I wrote a letter asking for immediate reconsideration of a decision to deny a portion of the temporary urgency change petition the TUCP. The denied portion of the TUCP would have allowed the Department of Water Resources and the Euro U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to increase pumping for February and March. Because uh, they understood the severity of the drought, state and federal fish, fish agencies support all provisions of the TUCP, including limited increases in pumping. Given the support of these agencies, it's been a little difficult for uh, some of us to understand the reason, the reasons behind the continued denial to increase pumping. This is why, if the denial is not reversed, we have asked for a written description of the scientific analysis used to refute the scientific conclusions of the state and federal fish agencies. However, it is my hope that this board sides with the state and federal fish agencies and supports increases in pumping in February and March. In this fourth year of drought, it is essential to balance the needs of people and the needs of the ecosystem by increasing pumping in February and March. I thank you for your work. Water is a very difficult topic and something that's very precious to all of us, and we need your expertise to help us with this problem. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your time. I thought Senator I heard Cannell. you call my name. Uh, good morning. I'm Senator Anthony Canella. Uh, thank you for uh, having this hearing and allowing us to, to say a few words. I represent the 12th Senate District, which is largely an ag-based district. Uh, it includes the west side of Fresno, which very much is uh, affected by whatever decision is made here today. And we're in our fourth year of drought. Obviously, we've got to make some tough decisions so we can balance the need of the environment and people. And I think that that was done with the TUCP. You have folks that have experts when it comes to fisheries. They, make, uh, they come to an agreement that allows for ag exports. And then really with the one person's decision to uh, not uh, include their, their work, by the experts, by the way, to say, no, we're not going to have any exports, that's a, that's a very damaging decision. And we've really got to make sure, again, agriculture, not only what it does economically for my district, which is the, the number one uh, uh, enterprise in the 12th Senate District, but also we feed the world. And, and what we do when it comes to water really affects the world's food supply. So uh, I just ask that you would take into consideration what the experts have said, the experts that, that look at the health of, of fish and, and what we do to our fisheries and reverse the decision that was made because it's, uh, it's going to have a real impact on my district. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let me go and I understand that Senator Nielsen is also here, so he can also come. Well, are, you, are you deferring to the Senate? That's something great. Come, come, come on, I don't, come on up. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair uh, and the Board. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to come before you today uh, and weigh in uh, on the discussion uh, before you. I don't want to repeat uh, the Senator's comments, but I would implore that going forward uh, through this drought, cooperation amongst all the interested parties uh, is tantamount to our success uh, as a state and the protection of what couldn't be a more critical resource. And I think uh, as you discuss this today, there is certainly an appearance uh, by many of the stakeholders that a unilateral decision uh, made by a staff member on uh, an issue of this magnitude 
uh, might be inappropriate. And uh, obviously, today we're here to play out uh, the remainder of that process, an important part uh, of that process. There's broad consensus, uh, from certainly from the layperson's perspective, amongst agencies, both state and federal, uh, on what should be done, and actions uh, that were adopted were not entirely uh, concurrent with those recommendations. Uh, it couldn't be more important, and I think our success going forward, dealing with the drought, projects that are in front of us uh, require a confidence and a, and a level of cooperation that, frankly, uh, the decision as it stands uh, at the staff level erodes. So I would encourage you uh, to reconsider that uh, today in these discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I see that Senator Vidak is here. Please join us. Senator Nielsen will be here a little bit later. Good morning, and uh, thank you for for being for listening. I really, really do appreciate it. Uh, my remarks will be brief. Uh, I'm Andy Bidak, Senator from the 14th District between Fresno and Bakersfield, and I represent close to a million people that live in the Central Valley. Many of them are going to be here today, and you'll get to hear from them. But what I do want to say, there's real human suffering from this lack of water and this drought, and they're going to tell some very, very compelling stories today. We, the human suffering is just, um, I really wish you all just come down to my district and see what's happening. We need to put our people and our jobs first, and I strongly, strongly urge you to reverse your devastating decision and let water flow to the families, the farmers, the farm workers, schools, and the businesses that desperately need it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two cards from legislative aides, one for Senator, from Senator Feinstein and one from Assemblywoman Bonilla, Sarah Brady on the latter, and Shelley Abajan from uh, Senator Feinstein's. Are you, do you want to speak now and leave, or do you want to stay and listen and speak? I'm going to stay and listen, but I'll go ahead and speak now if I can. That'd be fine. And also, I, one thing I would uh, suggest, since some of the uh, elected officials obviously have uh, challenging schedules, I think it is important to listen to the full range of opinions that we're going to hear today. So I, since I can't, because there's a petition, I want to ask staff to offer follow-up briefings to each of the elected officials that spoke to explain the full range of things. I do think there's a fair amount of misinformation that will be explained in the course of the hearing. I mean, reasonable lines can differ on a lot, but there's a lot of just basic misunderstanding of the procedural setting we're in. And so if you all can um, offer to the senator's office to come in and sit down with them and explain, I think that would be quite helpful. Hi. Hello, I'm Shelley Abajan, and I represent Senator Feinstein in Central California. And um, I'm just going to read a statement or a few points from the senator here. As staff for Senator Feinstein, I would like to present a letter to the State Board submitted by a bipartisan, bicameral group of congressional members, Senator Feinstein, House Majority Leader McCarthy, and Congressman Calvert, Costa, Denham, Nunes, and Valadeo co-signed the letter. These members oppose the, direct, the executive director's denial of the water export adjustments proposed by Reclamation and DWR and strongly urge the board to approve the project's operator's petition fully. I want to emphasize that the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and the C California Department of Fish and Wildlife all support the request and have determined that it would be not cause additional harm to protected fish species. These are agencies who know the fish, who know the system's effects on fish very well. And finally, the export adjustments are modest and careful, are for the short term, and would provide limited but needed flexibility to increase water supplies only when more water is moving through the system, but without harming protected fish. So I'm going to resubmit the letter that was sent to the board, and thank you for the opportunity to represent no. Senator. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Ms. Brady? Hello. 
My name is Sarah Brady. I'm here on behalf of Assemblywoman Susan Bonilla. She represents uh, portions of the East Bay and the Delta region. Um, so she supports the denial for additional pumping. She doesn't want to see any additional exports of water from the Delta. Um, she wants to see a comprehensive water policy that supports all regions of the state, not prioritizing the needs of one region over those of any other. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I hope you'll be able to stay with us a while as well. Thank you. Uh, terrific. I, I'm now, uh, I'm going to go back to explain the order of proceedings for everyone who's here. Um, we're first going to hear a brief introduction by staff uh, and a presentation by the Department of Water Resources. We're then going to hear um, uh, a presentation from our executive director, followed by explaining what he did followed by a policy presentation, a policy presentation by the petitioners, that's DWR and the Bureau, and a presentation, uh, then we'll have a presentation by a panel formed by Congressman Costa and Senator Canella um, with a number of different uh, players. Uh, next, we're gonna hear a technical panel presentation from the petitioners and the fisheries agencies to explain what it was they uh, recommended and answer questions. Uh, it's gonna be followed by a grower panel then a water contractor panel, then a San Joaquin County and Delta interest panel, and finally two non-governmental organization panel presentations. I may move these around because a couple of the presenters wanted to go a little bit later. I'm gonna be trying to juggle that consistent with what they uh, requested, and we'll be trying to find some time uh, before lunch to be able to allow people who just can't stay later uh, to speak, but again, our our practice has been to allow panel presentations from stakeholders first, but I, I wanna be able to try and find some free board, uh, but we uh, do need to get through our panel presentations um, as well, so I, I'm sure that's gonna be a bit of a channel, uh, uh, a challenge. We may pause during some of the panels to hear from elected officials as a courtesy, um, and any elected official who's in the room and hasn't already should let the clerk know uh, that they're here. I'm trying to scan, but I can't see that well, even with my glasses some of the time. Um, yes. Really? Right. Really? All right. Well, we may do one of the panels even before we do the technical panel, right? but not before the policy panel. And Bill is doing the hydrology. Yeah, I saw that, it's just not in the notes here. Um, all right, I already said that. Um, I, I wanna say we do have about six hours of panel presentations proposed. I just wanna encourage people, um, including the panels, the speakers will be limited, the public will be limited to three minutes to try and be as concise as you can. Generally, one makes one's points more effectively in the most concise manner possible, particularly when we're gonna be listening to people all day long. So the most concise comments uh, actually may be the most uh, effective, just a word of advice. Uh, if you intend to speak today, please fill out a blue speaker card and give it to the clerk. If you're not sure whether you wish to speak, uh, just write a note that says, if necessary, and we'll call on you, and you certainly don't have to speak. Um, uh, in order to ensure all participants have an opportunity to participate, since we're gonna have so many people, we'll be limiting comments to three minutes. We've generally found three minutes, you can, in fact, make your point uh, for what we should be considering for next steps uh, or in action. Uh, to open, I just wanna say a couple uh, brief thoughts and uh, I'll see if my colleagues want to, uh, to add anything before we start. The day is largely for us to listen. I just wanna start by thanking folks who submitted comments for the reason tone, mostly I think, uh, thoughtful comments. Um, I also wanna note, as I said earlier, there's a fair amount of misunderstanding of what was actually done here and the setting that we're in, and so I hope that folks will listen to those explanations to kind of understand where we actually are in process and what we are talking about. I also wanna acknowledge that in a drought, there are horrible, consequences, unimaginable in some cases, consequences for people and for fish and wildlife, and there is plenty of pain to go around due to the drought. Um, 
the issues that we're dealing with do involve judgment. Um, they involve water rights. They involve the law. And, but they do involve judgment upon which reasonable minds can disagree. And I can't tell you how to argue with the time you have, but I do encourage you to make your case while acknowledging others' legitimate positions, as we have to. Um, we're charged with protecting all beneficial uses and trying to maximize all ben beneficial uses as best we can. We don't get to pick a favorite and toss the rest. That's not an option for us. So please put yourselves in our shoes and help us see it your way. Um, all I suggest is that you make your case versus denigrating somebody else's case. You can disagree to be sure, but please let's um, deal with this terrible situation that we're in, this horrible situation that faces all of us, uh, which call for us, I think, to be compassionate rather than combative towards each other. So I look forward to hearing from you all today uh, as you help us figure out how to navigate our next steps. Does anybody else want to say anything at the outset or whenever? Well, I too want to thank everyone for their uh, comments. I've got a big binder here, and I've learned a lot uh, over the last couple of days reading through things, but I'm very anxious to hear the panelists and also uh, the commenters. And I would just uh, like to make a, a few comments of my own um, and um, ask the uh, commenters and the panelists to do what they can to uh, target the discussion, much like what you've uh, said, Madam Chair. Um, the drought is uh, very serious for everyone, people and fish, as, as you've said. Um, one of the things that I've been sort of disappointed in last year and um, even going in this year, there's been a lot of analysis and discussion about impacts to the fisheries other than the uh, UC Davis report on uh, impacts to agriculture, we haven't had a lot of that information come up. And I know a lot of folks are f here from the agricultural community, and um, I really do think that it's important for us to hear about the impacts. Uh, the order does go through water supply um, impacts in terms of allocations, but there's a, not a lot in it about um, impacts to communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, unemployment, et cetera. Whatever we do, one way or the other, is not going to resolve uh, those issues. Um, the ramped up pumping uh, would only provide for you know, a modest benefit. Um, our executive director did go through the impacts to the fisheries, but one of the things that sort of, um, it doesn't, it's not clear to me, is um, the uh, analysis with respect to our specific review. So the fishery agencies have a very targeted review. We have a different level of review. So I would be asking the commenters to do what you can to target your discussion to our specific review on uh, the unreasonable impacts to fish and also to be targeting the information that we should be looking at in terms of uh, the benefit to the areas that uh, could benefit. I'm referring mainly to the um, provision regarding um, ramped up exports. Um, I think that that would put us in a best position to be able to balance if we could really have a, a targeted review. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and another piece of that, of course, is unreasonable impact on other water rights holders, and we'll be hearing from some of them today. It's not just water users versus fish, it's water users versus water users as well, and that's what we're charged with uh, hearing from. Anything else before we start? Okay, any time. Um, okay, we're ready to begin the presentations. Uh, Tom, do you want to introduce Bill to start? It's always important to start with the hydrology. Yes, I thought it would be important to hear what the uh, is in store for us regarding hydrology in the near future and what we've seen this year. So Bill Croyle, the drought coordinator for the Department of Water Resources, is going to provide us an update on uh, hydrology to date and some uh, estimates of what we might be seeing in the future. Is Bill here? Bill, I long for the day that you're wearing your your flood response hat again. Yeah, 
let's do that. Well, in December we got a chance to do that <laughs> a little bit, so we. Uh, it was just to taunt you. Yeah, we. It was good to stay on point and mm -hmm. dust off some of our flood response activities. Um, certainly welcome the rainfall. We hope for more soon. Mm -hmm. um, so. Chairwoman Marcus, members of the board, members of the audience. My name is Bill Croyle. I'm the drought manager for the California Department of Water Resources. And so I'll start off our presentation today with a little bit of overview of where we are kind of a statewide drought, a little bit of snow, and um, then we'll take a break, uh, hear from the executives, and then get into some of the nuts and bolts and kind of the technical discussion of uh, rainfall, where we're at in the state, a lot of on the hydrology within the specific reservoirs throughout the state and then kind of get into more of our technical presentation. So with that, um, we've seen this slide a few times. It is updated based on our current uh, state of affairs, but I think it's a really good place to start with kind of where we're at statewide. Um, certainly last January, the governor declared a drought emergency. This is a serious drought, as I already said this morning. Um, you know, we've had unprecedented um, coordination, collaboration, between all the way from the White House, the state, the governor's office, um, through our local water agencies, down to NGOs, and, and the public have been a big part of our overall um, response to this dry conditions. And certainly, we've all flipped over a lot of rocks and, and seen some opportunities to learn some lessons. And I think, as a whole, um, we are responding to this drought in ways we've never had to in the past. Um, as a reminder, this is our, you know, um, third year going on fourth year of drought. Um, 2014 was one of the warmest or the warmest on record. I think that's important when we look at how we use our water um, for a various beneficial uses. Um, third year on, on, on record is uh, for drought. I think some of us are looking back. If you take 2011 out of, out of the um, kind of last eight years, we see really seven years of less than average precip. And I think that's important when we look at how we manage all of our water resources, our snowpack, our surface water reservoirs, as well as our groundwater throughout the state. Um, you know, last time we talked, we anticipated kind of the climatic predictions. We're looking at a warmer, drier um, 2015. It seems like it's playing out that way. Um, January was certainly historically dry, especially in this area, but in many areas of the state, you know, we saw warmer temperatures and, and clearly drier. Um, and we set records that go back to 1850. Um, so we, although our Northern California has had the benefit of some, you know, <laughs> quite a bit of rainfall in the early part of this water year, um, south of this area, through kind of what we call the Highway 80 corridor, we've seen not enough, not near as much as we've seen in the north. And so that affects our statewide storage, not only here locally within the central Sierras, um, the coastal range, but certainly in Southern California as well as we continue to <coughs> Uh, work towards conserving the water we have, um, but drawing down those supplies that we have um, parked. When I say we, that's the global, you know, water supply that we have throughout the state. Um, groundwater um, basins continue to be tapped to uh, take care of those water needs that we've seen throughout the state. Uh, we continue to see uh, groundwater elevations um, lower, again, as we move and continue through the dry conditions. Um, so that being said, on almost on a daily, weekly basis, we continue to see um, and hear and work on um, additional wells going dry, our challenges with some reservoirs that are very low that provide surface water sources. Um, and so with that, it's been quite a challenge to really collect that information and prioritize our overall response. And when I say we, that's the, all of the state and federal agencies working with local agencies to respond to those degrading conditions. Um, again, um, the high level of coordination and collaboration, again, is unprecedented, and I think I acknowledged to here this morning already, and I think that's what it's going to take to, you know, work through these difficult times. Um, our next slide is kind of our, it's updated as of February 10th. This is kind of NOAA's and USDA's kind of snapshot on our um, drought monitoring. I think the, the take-home message here is, you know, the region, not just California, but the region is challenged by these dry conditions. And really, this hasn't changed much in the last year and plus now. Um, some of us have been working on drought for almost a year and a half, um, and obviously intensely since this last uh, 
a year ago, uh, January and December. Um, and so I think this graphic also shows that there's short-term and long-term impacts as kind of looked at by mm -hmm. the drought monitor. So it's both hydrology, ecology, as well as kind of the um, impact on agriculture and wetlands and things like that. Um, we, th this hasn't changed much. Last, last uh, January, we saw a, sl a slide up comparing last year to this year. And so the drought has intensified since January of this last year. So over the year, conditions, you know, are uh, more devastating. Um, however, this particular graphic, if you look back, say, December, um, December, especially Northern California, looked look better because we saw some more mm -hmm. um, rain in the north. But, um, and so, but up until then, we saw pretty much most of Californ California was kind of in the extreme or exceptional category, which means the effects of the drought conditions or devastating um, throughout the state. Um, so the two areas in California that have seen some improvement um, is really, of course, the southeast part of the state with the monsoon weather we've had, and then also the northwest corner of the state where we've um, seen kind of our rainfall uh, approach average. Um, we still have a number of locally declared emergencies. We did drop one county this last month because of the rainfall on the, on the coast, um, Mendocino. Um, so. Again, it's because of the impact and their small water systems rely on small water bodies to provide those critical water needs, and so they've now rescinded their proclamation. But we do have a number of local drought task force meetings that are working to try to resolve those issues at the local level, and, and of course the state agencies and various federal agencies are plugging into those local drought task force members to put those, you know, try to address those needs that are in place. Um, so the drought is very much um, extreme, if not exceptional, and the impacts, as discussed already today, are, are heartfelt throughout the state. Um, I'm going to talk real quick on snowpack. So our um, statewide normal to date is looking at 22 percent, so we did see some benefit um, with the recent snows in last month, or uh, December, um, but we're starting to see that, that come off. Um, and so our 17 percent of average, and that's important as we look at where our reservoirs are today and what the, the snow uh, runoff looks like for the spring and, and the summer. And we'll get into some of the hydrology and the graphics a little bit later. Um, you know, part of this next graphic, I'm sorry for all the numbers, but I think um, a lot of questions are coming up with, well, compared to last year. And, and I think because of the rainfall that Thank we you. did see, um, it, it's kind of interesting to see where the snow fell compared to last year. Last year, um, the Northern California had a little less snow this time of year than, say, Central and Southern uh, Sierras. That's kind of switched around. Um, now we have a little bit more snowpack in the north uh, than we did, say, last year. So um, again, that looks at how we, you know, managing our reservoirs and what we anticipate for a runoff. And so with that being said, um, we'll go back to our executive presentation unless there's any questions. No, it's sobering. Even the numbers that are better are only a little bit better. Not and much better. And then there are plenty of numbers that are worse, so. Right. Questions? Sure. I have one question, Bill. Uh, when or what will trigger a redefinition of what is normal? <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that question. There's quite a bit of discussion um, going back to our friends from Australia that spent quite a bit of time with a number of us in the governor's office as we kind of, you know, what triggered a response, say, in Australia after 10 years of drought? And it kind of took them about six years to kind of acknowledge we're in a tough spot and that we're going to have to change how we um, do things socially, technically, uh, information we collect and process. Um, the drought. Uh, Governor's Drought Task Force and staff, um, we've had a number of meetings kind of along those lines, especially um, as kind of our, some of our challenges that we see small communities, as an example, individual wells, where we kind of get at, you know, what are we going to do? So we, how do we support local government in supporting those individuals as a state? And so there's some policy calls. And certainly, you know, we've had some of those discussions like, it, you know, we're, this is not six years, <laughs> it's three last year or four this year, and so we're having those discussions, you know, wh what does that look like? In fact, there's a meeting later this week to kind of get at kind of the 
um, the deep dive on what those policy issues are so that we can, do we need to make a change? What are the conditions that cause us uh, to make policy changes, funding changes, uh, and how we change the dialogue, say at the local level, to become, you know, now we're responding to drought, but we, as we're responding, we need to learn lessons on how we prepare for drought too. So that whether it's groundwater, surface water, how we manage and understand where our snow or is or isn't, um, and how we look at conservation um, as a tool to manage what we have. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, challenging I question. That, uh, some of the water board folks will be part of that discussion. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it does seem to me that at some point we won't be talking so much about drought mm -hmm. as about the new normal. Right. It may not be this year, it may not be next year, it may be 2020, 2025, but um, you know, it's, we are being told it will, this is not all the year. We're on track. And so uh, the sooner we can figure out how and engage the public and <coughs> get closer. How we, how we talk about it. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, the, uh, the sooner we get to um, a place where we can actually talk about reality, not an a hope or an anomaly, uh, the better, I think. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bill, for all your work. Always appreciate it. Now, in my order, we next have you, Tom. Yes, I think that's right. Illuminating what, in fact, you did. I hope so. And the so. setting. Um, yeah, I did want to start with the hydrology because it is sobering, yeah. as you said, and uh, it uh, certainly sets the stage, I think, for all the discussions that you'll be hearing today. I'm going to be uh, a little more talkative than I normally am. I'm kind of uh, terse in my discussions with board members during meetings, but it seems as though I need to explain in a little detail what my thinking was here. Uh, let's see. This is just an overview slide of what I'm going to be covering. I don't think we need to, I'll be covering it. Uh, so I thought we'd start by lessons from 2014. And uh, you know, there are many lessons from last year. Certainly one that we all learned is the devastating consequences across California of drought. Uh, and most visibly, we saw the effect of drought on people. In parts of the Central Valley, there were astronomical unemployment rates, record levels of food boxes were being distributed to the needy, schools saw dramatic declines in enrollment, labor shifted elsewhere around the state, some small communities saw domestic supplies dwindle to within a few weeks of disappearing, while others have had to install public showers and rely on trucked water to supply these showers. Farmers have had to follow thousands of acres of land, and some of the statistics are provided uh, on the slide. I'm going to be, a lot of the discussion coming uh, next is going to cover a lot of the fishery questions because of the findings I needed to make in this order, but I thought it would be, it's best to start with the recognition of, uh, as uh, board member Diadamo said, that you know, there is a, a large human cost to uh, this drought. So there also were lessons uh, regarding ecosystem impacts last year. We uh, saw 95% winter run Chinook salmon mortality to, due to uh, heat stress up on uh, the Shasta, uh, up on the Sacramento River below Shasta. And I think that's a pretty striking lesson to me because um, of how wrong some of the assumptions were and how mistaken I was last year when I approved actions needed to implement the drought operations. And I made a finding that operations in conformance with the plan would have no unreasonable effects on fish and wildlife. And the effect of the drought and Shasta operations, as you see, resulted in that level of mortality. So uh, I have to concede that the findings that were made were uh, just wrong. Uh, I had some concern that the temperature model used to develop Shasta operations may not ac accurately predict temperature outcomes, but I was hopeful that we'd get through this without this kind of effect, and uh, I unfortunately it didn't happen that way. Um, as you'll see, this TUC approval has conditions to look into the modeling with the intention that we will try to do better uh, this year. 
Other things that we saw in the estuary itself, delta smelt at the lowest level uh, index in uh, history. Uh, longfin smelt at very low, second lowest. Striped bass, American shad, threadfin, threadfin shad, all at very low indices. And of course, the concomitant effects on um, uh, commercial and recreational fishing. So, uh, thought I'd just briefly mention where the water exiting the delta uh, went last year. Um, there was about six million acre feet that was uh, leaving the delta last year. Out of that, about half of it went to maintain salinity control in the delta. Um, that, that gets forgotten a lot. Yeah, it does. It does. And, uh, but, you know, it's obviously in order to protect irrigated agriculture in the Delta, plus the municipal intakes in the Delta, plus, of course, the export pumps and their agricultural and municipal uses, uh, you know, we need to maintain that hydraulic barrier. So there was also, we had a discussion yesterday about how much water was exported. Uh, you know, as you can see, there was 1.86 million acre feet exported. You, you recall that there was actually a 0% CVP allocation to the export water supply contractors and a 5% SWP allocation. Uh, you know, there was obviously transfer water in there. Some water was delivered that had to be transferred across the delta uh, that was actually at the previous year's water. And that's, so that shows up as exports, but it didn't show up as part of this year's contract, last year's contract allocation. And of course, there were water transfers. Uh, 747,000 acre feet is the amount of water that could have been exported uh, if there were no controls on the export pumps. That's the additional amount that could have been exported if the only controls on the export pumps were the Corps of Engineer permit on the state water project and the channel capacity for the CVP. Uh, you know, the, the export restrictions like old and middle river flows and things like that are what kept 747,000 acre feet plus the EI ratio from the board's D1641 and other requirements kept the projects from accessing that 747,000 acre feet. And then there was another 450,000 acre feet that was uh, simply not accessible in any event and flowed out uh, to, the best be to the benefit of the uh, estuary. That's interesting. Uh, you might wonder, by the way, the last year the TCP order that I approved had uh, 400,000 acre feet of uh, saved water. And you might ask, well, where did that water go? And, you know, it, it's difficult to say where it went exactly. You really can't quantitatively say because, after all, it, w it wasn't colored and you couldn't see it. But, uh, um, you know, because the exports were, in my opinion, the least high priority uses, I, I think most of that water ended up in that export, export bar. Uh, other people might have different characterizations, but it probably appeared either there or in the in-basin deliveries or in carryover storage at the projects. But it was in one of those three locations. Weren't, uh, weren't some of it, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding what you're saying, so, didn't some of it go to temperature control? And I know there were operational agreements where the temperature control molecule of water was also used for contract deliveries, which seemed to be a kind of cool thing. Yeah, uh, temperature control, cool enough, like yeah. all uh, water that's released from upstream reservoir has multiple uses. It right. serves uh, temperature control, fishery benefits in the area that it's passing through. But those are all non-consumptive uses. Mm -hmm. You know, here we're talking about consumptive uses, water that's actually exiting the delta in one way or another. Uh, you know, water that exits into a saline sink is consumptively used, if you will. Mm -hmm. Water that's exported is consumptively used. And so the water, the 400,000 acre feet, serves non-consumptive uses, absolutely temperature control, recreation, fisheries, but it also served consumptive uses of 400,000 acre feet somewhere in the system. And this is so in the red box? Well, red? that's how I look at it. I'm sure okay. other people might look at it, but well, yeah, it it's in the 